Hello everybody, in today's video I've gone green. Don't worry, I've not been stricken by a madness or turned into a hulk. Instead, I've taken up a hobby of recycling, but doing it the fun way. Picture the scene, maybe earlier this year, perhaps even a couple of years ago. The sun made its annual appearance and you decided to finally commit and buy that cheap convertible sports car you've been promising yourself for years. And you do the only real sensible thing, you buy yourself a Mazda MX-5. You run it around for a bit, enjoy it, have a little bit of fun in the sun, maybe even spend some money upgrading it, making it a little bit quicker, a little bit sharper handling. But then come MOT time and you get the worst news of all. You find out your car is holier than Mother Teresa's Swiss cheese collection. So what to do? You've spent a fortune on this car, you love it to pieces, but to get it roadworthy again is going to cost even more money. You could of course punt it on as a spares or repairs job for someone to take on, but that almost would be a little bit defeatist. You could of course spend the money having it fixed yourself, but that's going to cost a lot and the car you'll end up with is the same one that you thought you had in the first place. But happily, there is another way. For the sum of your broken MX-5 and £10,000, you could make yourself one of these, an MK Indy RX-5. The idea of making a Lotus 7 style kit car is of course not a new one. The idea has been around for, well, as long as the Lotus 7 really, because that itself was also a kit car and remains so today in the form of the Caterham 7. MK themselves are not new players in this field, having arrived in around 2000. The original Indy was so cool because unlike many other escort based kit cars of the time, it used a Sierra as its base, so inherited that car's independent rear suspension, making it a much more competent handling car than its rivals. This is the RX5 and it's a much more modern design, having been introduced in 2017, shortly after after the company was acquired by its current owners, Sean and Neil, who are very nice people, very passionate about not just their cars, but more importantly, their customers too. The RX-5 is the entry point into the MK Sports Cars lineup, which also includes a number of higher powered and bike engine variants of much the same thing. So what's this car have in it? Well, you have the gubbins from a 1998 to 2000 NB generation Mazda MX-5. The idea being that you buy this car, find a donor, and then take 300 hours of your own time assembling it at home. Though factory builds are an option for most of the MK lineup, the RX-5 really is designed for the home builder. The main reason behind that decision being the fact that as you're going to be using a used MX-5 as your basis, many of the parts from that car may require cleaning, though if you need help, they do offer a stripped down service so you can take your donor car to them and they will pull the parts from it for you to then deal with yourself. Naturally, this car has been designed from the ground up to be assembled by somebody with relatively little mechanical knowledge. And they say the only tool you should probably need to buy, which you may not already own, is a riv nut gun that costs the princely sum of about 15 quid. When I say today's program is all about recycling, I'm really not joking because from that MX-5 you will be taking, as you might imagine, the engine, the gearbox, the prop shaft, the differential, but also things like the uprights and hubs, front and rear, the almost complete braking system including handbrake and handbrake cable. You even take the exhaust manifold at the back, the fuel pump, some of the bracketry, some of the cooling pipe work as well, and you even have the complete dashboard and cluster from a regular MX-5. In fact, from a wiring perspective, this car is still an original MX-5. What you get from MK then is of course the bodywork, the steel tubular chassis, all of their suspension components including double wishbones front and rear, even up here you also have inboard suspension too, you've got this integrated little rollover hoop back here, as an option you can have a full exoskeleton style cage, you've also got the seats, if you so desire you can even have carpets, extra fit and finish inside, and really just about everything you need, which in the grand scheme of things isn't all that much, but certainly enough to have fun. 
and you get to benefit from the incredible network that MK have built up over the last 20 years. There are now over 5,000 MK cars out there on the roads, which is a lot more than I thought they were going to say. There's also a dedicated Facebook group of people that have built one of these cars to help those who are currently in the process, and they also supply a build guide to help you through it as well. And if the 140 horsepower of the standard 1.8 isn't enough, for just under £4,000, MK also offer an off-the-shelf, ready-to-go turbocharging kit, which lifts power by about 100 horses. They also do options for S2000 or K20 engines for those who want more power, but with that naturally aspirated feel. Even one of those, fully loaded, is only going to cost you the same as an entry-level Caterham with the small 660cc K car engine. And that's for a car with triple the power, and as far as I can see it, not much missing. So, how does this deliver out on the road? Before we get on to the specifics of this car, a couple of very important things to know. First off, my apologies if the audio is uh, less than stellar. One of the things that I would personally specify if I had one of these would be a nice big screen. There's also not a heater in here. I know it doesn't do masses of good, but it does make a difference. It's 16 degrees today, and uh, even so, after a little while, it does get nippy in here. But the important things to mention, naturally, in this video, I am gonna be drawing comparisons between this and the Caterham because that really is the original or the evolution of and of course it's the gold standard in this segment but it has been a few years since I've driven one in addition there are of course a whole host of other seven style cars the Westfield the low cost so on and so forth and I have no experience at all of those so though I'd love to be able to tell you how they compare I cannot if you're currently sat there at home with a low cost or a Westfield or something similar in your garage thinking, hmm, well, I think my car's even better. You should be talking about this one. Well, put your money where your mouth is. Drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every single video. Tell me what you got and let me know if I can drive it. I'll see if I can. Anyhow, as you might imagine, a lot of the vibe of this car is very similar to a 7, but there are some key differences. We'll start with the fairly obvious one, at least the obvious one where I'm sitting, the view. Yes, sure, it's the same general layout. You're right at the back of the car with most of it in front of you, but it is a very different look because the Caterham's a sort of more sharply profiled, more angular front without the sort of big bulge that this has. It means that when you're sat in this, it feels like you're driving something a little more muscular, a little more American, almost Viper-like in some ways, thanks to that very pronounced bulge. When it comes to what's behind me, not that you get an awful lot in the Caterham, but you do get a bit more. This particular car, as it's the demo one, hasn't got the boot floor installed, which you can have, though even with that in, you can tell you're not left with quite as much room as you get in a 7. None of these cars really are going to be winning awards for storage space, but that does seem worth mentioning if you were into the seven thing and that was sort of borderline for your storage requirements. Thanks to the fact that the car weighs very little, pulling away at a junction, it's very easy. The clutch has a nice weighting to it, but very easy to modulate, though it did catch my friend Anthony out. He has been helping me today once again with the drive-bys and also shooting a bit of a behind the scenes piece too. So if you want to see what goes into making these videos, check out the piece he's done for our second channel we've got together, JM and Friends, which I really must stop calling JM on Friends because that's going to get me into trouble. with the Atom that I drove not too long ago, eyewear is absolutely mandatory, particularly with the little carbon fly screen up here. You still get a fair battering, and after I'd gone to lunch, I realized I had actually caught a couple of flies with my glasses, so very, very glad that I had them. These are not particularly sexy items. They're actually DeWalt tool sunglasses, but they're very, very sturdy. So uh, sexy, no. Practical, yes. 
you're not likely to see a line of sunglasses from me anytime soon. Like in the Caterham, ride comfort is actually surprisingly good. These are really nicely damped cars. That fancy inboard suspension up front is quite a work of art. I actually really like it. And I have to say, the reason I was tempted to get in touch with the MK people is because I saw one at a show and I was absolutely blown away by the quality of it. You see, the thing with the Caterhams is having driven several now, yes, they are a kit car, but remember, all of the Caterhams that I have driven have been factory press cars. So not only were they built by people whose job is to build Caterhams all day long, these are the cars going out there that they know are going to be establishing what journalists think of the cars. So really, they should be the best out there. And even so, you get in them. The fuel gauge doesn't show the correct readings, which is quite disturbing when the fuel tank is a very small one. You'll find bits of trim not quite lining up and all sorts of things that really, really shouldn't be happening in a car that is 40 plus thousand pounds once option and um, doesn't appear to be much more than some scaffolding and a couple of school chairs. Speaking of which, these fiberglass seats I am absolutely in love with. I believe they are of MK's own making. They're sensational. They support me absolutely brilliantly. They're genuinely comfortable. They've got just a thin little piece of padding that's been put into them and I can genuinely do long miles in this car were it not for the fact that I'm being absolutely battered by the wind. In fact, with a screen on and some headphones, you really could travel a fair distance in this thing. Shall we test the turning circle out? Don't expect miracles. But actually, better than I would think. And uh, unsurprisingly, this car, very, very easy to place. As you can see, all four corners, pretty good. And one of the real key things about this car, and I suppose it's both a negative and a positive, is because it takes quite so much from the MX-5 donor car, it means that there's a lot of parts on here which can be changed for better or for worse, depending on what that car is. So this specific one has a five-speed gearbox. Has a fair bit of play in it. I would say it's not quite as sharp and as snickety as those in the Caterhams that I've driven, but it feels like the shift itself is good, but it's just a little worn, some bushings or something maybe need sorting. This car has been built, not to show off how good a car can be, but as a real-world representative example of what you're actually going to get, and I commend MK for that. So, on that note, as the MX-5 was also available with a six-speed gearbox, if you get one of those, you can drop it in. No problem whatsoever, it will fit. Likewise, if the car happened to have different wheels, like this car's donor did, those will also bolt straight off. And one of the best things about this car, really, is the level of customization and personalization. Using an MX-5 as a base car is a stroke of genius, nothing less, because it's such a readily available car with great aftermarket support and very affordable prices. So whatever it is you want to do to this car, basically, if it fit a 5, it'll fit this. Not everything, of course, but a lot will. It is, of course, pretty basic. I like the little MK engraved shift knob they have here. That's very pleasing to hold, very satisfying. Also, the fact they've just pinched the whole MX-5 dashboard is, again, genius, really. Saves so much hassle and effort. The only downside, really, is because it is quite far down and quite far away, when it comes to just checking your speed, it does take a little longer than I would really like. And this thing can gather speed at a fair rate. For the adrenaline junkies out there, the car in standard guise is unlikely to be potent enough. Even in second gear, braking traction felt near impossible, but to me, certainly without a screen in place, the 140 horsepower of this example was plenty to raise a smile. 
Allegedly, this car had a limited slip differential, but I think that like in many MX-5s, it was no longer fully functional, as when on lower grip surfaces, only one wheel ever wanted to spin. The tiny steering wheel gave a great sense of connection to the road, but I would say from memory that a Caterham is marginally better. That being said, compared to just about any modern car, it was alive with feeling. Oh, I hope you can hear this, otherwise there's going to be a lot of voiceovers. The Atom you can hear me in, but this feels like I'm getting battered even more than that, if that's possible. Speaking of which, at cruising speed, you know, 70 mile an hour, this is thoroughly unpleasant. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. The brakes do seem to be one of the weak points of the car for me. You need just a little bit more pressure and travel on the pedal than I would like. However, when you do ask for it, they will stop you and they will also block quite easily. This is a laugh, this car. A real laugh. Sometimes I think it's a good thing that it's been so long since I've driven the Cater because what's really important here is, does this match my memory of those cars? And I don't say, yeah, it, it does. Very fine in their bends, very playful car I want it to be though. Not particularly tail happy with this kind of power. Maybe not quite the interactivity of that car, but again, compared to just about anything else you'll have driven, this is wild. It's an absolute laugh. Dirt cheap to maintain. Again, MX-5 running costs. If I had one of these, I would do my own oil changes. That's how easy it looks to work on. So here's the thing for me, here's the real interesting thing. With a Caterham, you're talking realistically about at least 30,000 quid. Now, in real terms, it's not actually going to be an expensive car to own because they're reasonably reliable if they break in simple, cheap parts. They don't drink all that much fuel and they hold their money really, really well. But while you own it, that is money you don't really have access to. That is 30 plus grand not in your bank account. And if you only drive the car, a handful of times a year, which where the Caterham you're going to, that's tough. I try not to play the new versus used thing, but with something like a Caterham, it's almost impossible not to, because you're going to be looking at it going, well, hang on a minute, 40,000 pounds, you can easily spend, easily spend, without going wild, there's 60 plus of you on the top end ones. That's an R8, or an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. That's a lot of money. You know, for the 620R, okay, yeah, sure, it's fast and wild, crazy and all that. But that's Ferrari 360 money. I just can't justify it. If you want to try and explain to someone that's not into cars why a Caterham is £50,000, it can't be done. It just can't be done. Now, I look forward to revisiting a Caterham, but for me, the simple fact is this. If you were looking at buying something, which is going to be ultimately a toy, whether for road or track, and these are pure toys. I know a few particularly dedicated individuals do drive them daily, but those are nutters. Qualified, card-carrying nutters. They're not representative of normal people. But putting them aside, this is an occasions event car. You can easily see someone not using them six months of the year. And when that's the case, 15 grand, let's call it, much easier to justify. Much, much easier. Is it quite as good as a Caterham? You know, it's so close, I don't want to call it. And the fact is, it's about a third the price. And it's just not a third the car. So I think the people at MK should be very, very proud of what they've created. I've no doubt that there will be people out there screaming blue murder that they're taking gorgeous old Mazda MX-5s and turning them into something like this. But then they're only doing it because at the moment, they're the cars that nobody's really that interested in spending money on keeping going. That's why the old one used a Sierra. But when the Sierra became too expensive a car to simply hack about, they changed to the MX-5s. And when the second gen MX-5 becomes too expensive and valuable and classic and desirable to just hack about, they'll move on to the third generation. And the best bit is, if you're really that way inclined, you probably could build one of these without butchering an MX-5 at all, because all the parts you need, you can't just buy as spares. It'd be a more expensive way of doing it, but you could do it. Anyway, I hope you've been able to hear some of that. I want to say a huge thank you to MK for lending me this car. To you, as ever, for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.